Hello, this is Mickey Yerday for Altaris Associates. Welcome once again to another one of our episodes on interesting stories in the history of diagnostics. Today, I'm going to talk about mummies. There's a lot of interesting history concerning mummies, what they are, how many there are around, and most interesting to, to me, at least, and hopefully it'll become to you as well, all that has been learned over the course of the last few decades now about the history of particular diseases in mummies. So uh, I look forward to sharing that with you. So first, let's define mummies, because in fact, there are a lot of different definitions out there. And I, I particularly like this one. Mummies are dead human or other animals whose soft tissues and organs have been preserved by either intentional or accidental exposure to preserving chemicals, extreme cold, and or dry conditions. Sometimes the definitions you'll find are related to simply the intentional mummification but in fact, most of the mummies that we know about are not from intentional mummification, but accidental mummification, as I'll point out in a few moments. The oldest sample of a mummy that was found that had been accidentally mummified is from 6,000 years ago, and it was found in a place called Inca Cueva IV in South America. On the other hand, the oldest mummy remains that have been found that were intentionally preserved were from a place called Spirit Cave in Fallon, Nevada. And those date to more than 9,400 years ago. So quite old. The Spirit Cave samples are probably from people that were wrapped in clothing and then had uh, plant materials wrapped around them uh, and desiccated. Now that's in contrast to the first occasion when we found people using extensive methodology to actually try to preserve a particular mummy. The first uh, example of using materials to try to preserve a mummy were found in Italy, and this dates back to 3,600 years ago. And uh, they used linen to wrap the body. They also used conifer resins and other aromatic plant materials to preserve it. Of course, Egypt has a long history of mummification. It goes back many thousands of years. Initially, they were using it in a manner where they simply desiccated the body, or the body was accidentally desiccated in the desert environment. But as time went on, the uh, process of mummification became actually ritualistic by about 2800 BCE. And at that point, uh, the process was pretty well laid out. In fact, um, in uh, about 440 BCE, the father of history, Herodotus, visited Egypt from Greece and wrote quite a bit about the process. But his descriptions were kind of vague and um, interesting, but not not definitive enough to help Egyptologists actually understand what the overall process was. But today, people know quite well exactly what the process was. In fact, there's been a lot of work done on experimentally reproducing the Egyptian methodologies, which is rather an interesting process in and of itself. But what we know a lot about now is the fact that they actually increased preservation by removing the major organs from the body. They did this... Uh, with all the major ones except for the heart. Uh, as a matter of fact, the heart was considered to be the center of thought and knowledge, and uh, they did not want to remove that. They left it in the body. But they did take out the liver, the stomach, the lungs, and the intestines. Most of the time, those preserved organs were placed into what are called canopic jars. And of course, I just happen to have a few sitting here, uh, and there were four types. They're associated with the sons of Horus. And so the phases on the top of these are actually supposed to represent that particular god. And specific uh, sons of Horus are associated with specific types of tissues. So firstly is the uh, baboon-faced uh, son of Horus, whose name is Happy, and the lungs go on this one. The second one is from uh, also one of the sons of Horus. It has a jackal face. Uh, his name is uh, Duamutef, and he's associated with the stomach, which are put into this canopic jar. The third one is from the only one that has a human face, which is Imseti, and that's for the liver. And I'm going to come back to this one later. Then fourth and last is from the, uh, the face of a uh, falcon, who is representative of the son of Horus named uh, Kevin Hensenuf. Kevin Hensenuf, that's a real mouthful. And this one received the intestines. Now note that I did not mention the brain. The brain wasn't thought to be much of anything and they actually scooped it out and threw it away. So uh, that didn't go anywhere. 
most of the other sources of mummies that uh, have been found, and they're found all over the world, by the way, um, have been accidental mummifications. Uh, this is true in many places, in other places of Africa, in Africa, Libya, South America, Canary Islands has quite a few as well. Uh, in Asia, many of the Chinese dynasties had mummies that were, were associated with them. Again, mostly accidental. Uh, these tend to be in dry areas like the Tarim Basin in China. And these go back to 2000 BCE, so quite a long ways back. Besides desiccation, there were other ways in which the bodies were preserved and became mum mummified. For instance, in Europe, in Ireland, the UK, uh, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, there are peat bogs. And those have been known to mummify people for a very long time. There have been many, many studies on those. In Siberia, as you might imagine, ice was uh, a major way in which the uh, bodies were preserved. Uh, in Iran, there are salt mines which had uh, preserved bodies within them. So lots of different ways in which there was accidental mummification. This also occurred in North America, uh, in the uh, United States and in Mexico. Again, desiccation in desert areas, but then ice in uh, the area which is Canada today. So a uh, number of different ways that could be done. In South America, there are the famous, what are referred to as Inca ice mummies, and they are found in high altitude locations all over South America. One very, very famous one uh, is the uh, mummy that was discovered in 1995 from a young girl named Juanita. That's what they called her, Juanita, the, Juanita the mummy. And it's a, just a remarkably preserved specimen. You can see her teeth, you can see her face. It's really quite well preserved. Intentional mummy, mummification did occur in a lot of other places besides simply Egypt. For instance, in Mexico, the Aztecs actually had a means of mummification, mostly desiccation, but they, they wrapped the, the individuals in plant materials and they had face masks on them and they, they sat them in a upright position so they could be in a, a sitting position, supine, so, so to speak. Very interesting. Similarly, the Chinchura people in South America also had a process of mummification more like Egyptian in that they they removed organs and they uh, they preserved the body by desiccation. These date back to as much as 3000 BCE, so actually rivaled the uh, sophisticated mummification in Egypt. And then a particularly interesting one is people that lived around various islands between the uh, northern Australian coast and New Guinea, the so-called Torres Strait. And um, there, there were some very interesting processes where uh, they preserved people not only by desiccation, but also by actually smoking them over a fire. And when they did that, they often collected the oil that was produced during that, which they used to make a paint uh, that they then decorated the uh, the dried mummy afterward with. So interesting, different methodologies all over the planet. And I think one of the most interesting ones is the practices of the Inca. The emperors and their wives of the Incan empire were in fact preserved through mummification. They removed the organs of the individuals and they desiccated them. They sat them up in position, they clothed them. And during the festivities of, of major events, they were brought out and they shared the feast. They sat along, along with everyone else. The Spanish actually made lots of observations about that and wrote about it. Unfortunately, they uh, destroyed most of those mummies later. Now, before I turn to the science I want to talk about, I want to talk about one more thing, which is some rather interesting uses of mummies. Yes, uses of mummies. One of the biggest uses has to be medical. And this comes from a strange situation that is related to uh, an improper translation of an Arabic word into various languages, including Latin. The Arabic word in question was supposed to mean betumen. And if you remember what betumen is, it's this oily substance that could be found naturally or is a product of distillation of petroleum products. It's used to make asphalt uh, today. In fact, the Arabs made a form of asphalt as well. It was also used to preserve mummies. And uh, there was some confusion between whether the word meant betumen or it actually meant mummy itself. And unfortunately, it was translated as mummy. Now, I suspect this goes back to, and I, I just haven't been able to document this completely, but I think it has to do with the fact that Pliny the Elder actually talked about bitumen as a medical material, talked about using it for healing wounds, uh, for stopping bleeding, uh, for epilepsy, for gout, and actually for getting rid of snakes. I don't know how that one's supposed to work. 
But I suspect what happened is that people looked at this and looked at the, that definition of the Arabic word and said, oh, we should be using betumen. We should be using mummies as medical material. And that's what ended up happening. It became extremely popular from the Middle Ages, in fact, through to the beginning of the 1900s, believe it or not. In fact, uh, give you some sense for how much was being used. Um, and you can only do this with Egyptian mummies. In the late 1500s, uh, a uh, entrepreneur named John Snyderson actually shipped 600 pounds of Egyptian mummies to England to be used in the use of medicine and other applications as well. So incredible. Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle, they both thought that it would be very useful for, they said, treating uh, bleeding wounds and also bruises. Seems to harken back to Pliny the Elder to me. So um, this went on for a very long time, and people ate it as well as a medication that they thought would be useful for many of those things that Pliny the Elder thought they would be useful for. Very surprising. Besides just that medical use, um, it was also used in making pigments for paints. In fact, there was a color that was very popular in the 15, 1600s called mummy brown. Very interesting. That was finally replaced, though, a few hundred years later with other materials instead of mummies. Besides humans, of course, the Egyptians were very fond of animals, and they preserved many of them through mummification as well, particularly the sacred ibis and the cat. In fact, there have been more than one million cat mummies found in Egypt. And the entrepreneurs became aware of that, and I don't know how they came to think this, but more than 100,000 of those cat mummies were shipped to various places in the world, mostly to England, to my understanding, for use as a fertilizer. And then one of the most interesting of all was posed by Mark Twain, who said that the mummies were used as fuel for locomotives. People believed this for a long time, but now most believe that that was just a joke, a typical Mark Twain joke. I'd like to finally switch, if you will, to the scientific aspects of mummies and uh, what work has been done over the course of the last many decades concerning the potential understanding of the history of the Egyptians themselves, as well as the application to understanding particular disease states within the Egyptian population. Now, you might think that isolating human DNA from mummies would be pretty straightforward and would be a great source of information, but actually it wasn't until 2017 that people were able to show that you could isolate DNA from mummies in a reproducible way, whether that it was actually from the mummy itself and not from contamination. It took a long time for a number of reasons, one of which is the fact that the embalming material, the resins and the, the components of it, inhibit PCR reactions. So that's, that's a problem. And that work was conducted by Johannes Krauss and his group from the Max Planck Institute of the Science of Human History. You've heard his name before. I've talked about him before. His group is just remarkable in their ability to manipulate ancient DNA. And they found that they could isolate it from the teeth, which is a popular source, uh, both from the tooth itself and from the so-called uh, calculus of the tooth, uh, also from soft tissue. And they were able to show that they could isolate from 151 Egyptian mummies, mitochondrial DNA from 90 of those mummies, but it was much more difficult to isolate the actual uh, human nuclear DNA. Uh, they only got it from three particular specimens. Now, of course, one of the reasons for that is the fact that mitochondrial DNA is very stable, but also because there's from 1,000 to uh, 2,500 times more DNA uh, from mitochondria than from the uh, human genome. They finally were able to do this, and they started to apply that to the human population within Egypt over, in fact, a 1,300-year period because they had specimens that spanned that length of time, uh, which is quite quite large. And over that period of time, there was a lot of turmoil within Egypt. There had been invasions of Assyrians and Nubians and Persians and Greeks and Romans. So they expected to find there be some significant modifications in the genomes over time. But they found remarkably little modification. Now, a lot of this was mitochondrial DNA, and it doesn't tend to mutate as often. But even though they had a very few number of uh, actual specimens from the nuclear uh, genome itself, uh, those didn't change either. So that's a small sample size, but it's a very interesting start uh, in the potential to investigate uh, these issues within that population. But I think more interestingly, to me at least, is looking at the presence of pathogens. So the approach people have taken 
uh, has become what's referred to as paleomicrobiology. And the first report of this was back in 1910 by a Sir Ruffer. And Sir Ruffer actually investigated Egyptian mummies for the presence of schistosomiasis, evidence of schistosomiasis. And he found that he could see what appeared to be the ova of uh, schistoma hematobium. This was just a visual inspection. And as I'll describe it in a little while, we now have much more evidence than that. But these histological investigations coupled with evidence uh, of the actual presence of the pathogen itself are kind of the, the hallmark of this kind of paleomicrobiological study. So a lot of the early work in looking for pathogens using DNA, um, which by the way, is easier to find than human DNA within these mummies uh, and for a few reasons, one of which is which organisms they look for. The belief was that it should be probably easier to find presence of uh, organisms that caused TB, tuberculosis, and leprosy. Why? Because these are mycobacterium species, which tend to be really quite tough to break open. As a matter of fact, any of you who have been involved with the development of TB tests will recognize that that's really hard to do. You typically have to break them up physically with sonication. So people believe there's a good shot at looking for those particular organisms in samples. And so there have been a number of studies the first I would like to report is on TB. So a study from several years ago looked at the presence of, of uh, mycobacterium uh, DNA in samples from Egyptian mummies that ranged from about 3500 BCE to 500 BCE. And they coupled that with studies that they got from both Hungary and Germany, where they had samples that ranged between 600 and 1800 CE. So the, quite a large range. And very interestingly, they found the presence of MTB bacteria in virtually all of those populations. Not everybody, of course, but there was presence of them within mummies within those particular uh, time frames, all the way through. But they also looked for the presence of Mycobacterium bovis DNA, and this is associated with disease in cattle or in the earliest phases of those Egyptian mummies. It would have been from the domesticated auric which was a predecessor of cattle. It had been believed for many years that MTB in humans or tuberculosis was caused by mutations in this mycobacterium bovis. And um, they didn't find it. They did not find it. So they were a bit surprised and thought perhaps this notion of the um, spillover, if you will, from M. bovis to, to humans was not probably the cause, although that remains to be seen. Similarly, there was a study carried out looking for mycobacterium lepri, the cause of leprosy. And that was conducted by our old friend, uh, Johannes Krauss and his team. And uh, they, in fact, did look carefully for this. And they found the presence of M. leprae DNA in samples from, from Egypt. But these weren't until around 200 uh, BCE. So much, much later than M. tuberculosis. So those were the oldest samples found, around 200 BCE. So uh, a much, much later introduction into the human population. Besides investigating M. leprae in these particular samples, Johannes and his team were very interested in looking at the uh, presence of many other potential pathogens. And uh, they looked very broadly. Uh, they did a, a metagenomic search here. And they did find the presence of many other organisms. But they had a problem in that it was difficult to determine which were from the human when they were alive versus the uh, decomposition which occurred after and prior to the completing the mummification process versus actually just coming from the soil that uh, was associated with the burial. So they were not able to differentiate all of these. They realized that, for instance, though, the genus Clostridium tended to be associated with uh, the decomposition process. So they were able to exclude those, but they looked carefully at others. And I think there's still a lot to be done to determine what what were pathogens, what were not. But one that came through that looked very interesting was, in fact, hepatitis B. They did find clear presence of hepatitis B in the population, only in one individual, but in fact, from three different types of samples from that individual. And uh, I found it interesting that it was what is referred to as genotype A of hepatitis B, which even today is actually associated with infections in Africa, northern and western Africa, particularly the A1 and A3 subtype. So interesting how they're getting a lot more information as the studies get better and better. And I have one more infectious disease study that I thought you might find enjoyable. I, I love this story. It actually concerns the uh, 
Pharaoh Tutankhamun. It was known that Tutankhamun's family was um, quite ill, his immediate family in particular. And there are mummy samples from his immediate family uh, and his parents um, and Tutankhamun himself. There's been speculation for some time that perhaps he had malaria. Some of his symptoms seem to follow that. So there was a study conducted uh, and reported in 2010 on samples from he and his family. And in fact, they found the presence of three genes associated with Plasmodium falciparum, uh, one of the major pathogens for malaria. And uh, no doubt they found that those particular samples did include uh, the presence of that organism, including Tutankhamun himself. This seemed consistent with some of the pathology that had been noted within him. Uh, for instance, um, the presence of what is called Kohler's disease, um, but that is not necessarily uh, fatal, uh, but uh, malaria could very well be. So uh, the cause of death was almost certainly malaria, according to the investigators. Also, Tutankhamun had problems with, uh, with walking. In fact, in his uh, tomb was found a cane. And also what the authors of the paper referred to as an afterlife pharmacy. And they didn't give a lot of detail about what that is. Interestingly, one of the authors of this, in fact, the lead author, was Sahi Hawass, who refers to himself as the most famous archaeologist in the world. He's quite a character. I don't know if you've ever seen him in the Smithsonian Magazine or other places. He actually leads tours in Egypt. He's quite a quite a quite an interesting fellow. Another interesting study I, I thought was uh, one looking for the presence of toxoplasma. Toxoplasma being a, a nasty pathogen, which is actually passed from cats to humans. Uh, and given all those uh, preserved cats and all the domestic cats that were present in Egypt, people expected to find it, and indeed they did. Another interesting extension of an earlier study that I mentioned was looking for the presence of other types of schistosoma uh, in these mummies, and in particular in liver. And to do that, you had to actually go to the canopy jar. And the one they went for, of course, is this one from Imseti. And they took samples of the liver. They looked for the presence of schistosoma mansoni, which is more associated with liver than uh, urinary schistosomiasis, and indeed were able to find it present in a number of, sa of samples. And this dated back to about 1900 BCE. There's been a desire to study non-communicable diseases as well, but uh, it's very difficult because of the quality of the samples. I mentioned earlier that getting that uh, genomic DNA from the mummies has been very difficult, three out of 151 tries from the group in, uh, in, at Max Planck. So uh, that's been difficult. But there was one successful study worth mentioning, which had to do with looking for uh, mutant hemoglobin that's indicative of sickle cell anemia. There was a study conducted on teeth from Egyptian mummies dating back to about 1900 BCE. And they did find the presence of this sickle cell associated mutant of uh, hemoglobin. But one interesting study had to do with the presence of potential sickle cell disease in some of the mummies. And in fact, what they did uh, in this study is they, they took teeth from mummies dating back to about 3200 BCE and were able to show that uh, they did in fact contain the mutant form of hemoglobin that's associated with sickle cell disease. So despite all these findings and uh, fairly recent work, it's still considered that paleomicrobiology and what's also referred to as paleogenomics is still in quite an early stage. It's a little too unfortunate that it's focused on Egypt, but what are you going to do? You got so many mummies that they're shipping them as fertilizer to England. There's a lot more that needs to be done to improve technologies, improve uh, uh, capabilities, for instance, better methods for collecting samples, um, and also for library preps for NGS and uh, in particular single stranded DNA versions of that for uh, looking at small fragments and, and also uh, metagenomic analyses. All of these things are still in their infancy and hopefully will be applied more broadly as time goes on. And I'm also hoping that we see uh, applications to many other particular populations beyond simply the Egyptian population. I find it fascinating how much we are able to learn and will probably continue to learn about ancient diseases and over what period of time did they uh, exist? Can we learn more about uh, the or probable spillover from other animal populations, particularly in situations where they actually mummified the animals themselves, for instance, cats and toxoplasma? I also want to find out if we learn more about actually how these ancient peoples dealt with the diseases. 
Um, for instance, I sure would like to know what's in that afterlife pharmacy chest that's buried with Tutankhamun. What's in that? What did they know? What can we learn about from that? I hope we find out. So I hope you found this interesting, as I know I did. I, I really love this stuff and hope you do too. Um, and thank you once again for joining me in another episode of Interesting Stories in History Diagnostics. This is Mickey Yurday from Holteris Associates. Thank you and bye.